Hey guys, how's it going? We're here today with uh, Kit Fraser, uh, cinematographer and longtime friend of mine. So uh, we're going to be talking today a bit about his work and, and how he's getting on in this time and, uh, and maybe what's coming up for him in the future as well. Um, so how's it going, Kit? You been all right? Very good, thanks, sir. Yeah, I've been enjoying quarantine, which is um, maybe a little unusual to say, but I kind of just enjoying the time, uh, you know, with the family and also just trying to get my brain ticking over on things creatively. And that in itself is quite a challenge. You think, you know, what can I do in my day to day to keep me, um, you know, alert creatively when there's no shoots happening? Well, That's yeah. actually quite fun, you know. I mean, so you're in, you live in Spain, correct? Exactly, yeah, Madrid. Nice, nice. And you, you guys have been locked down there. What's the, what's the lockdown situation like now? It's, it's quite a militant world. Now it's, now it's relaxed a bit, but it was, was and it still is more strict than it is in the UK um, to the extent where right at the beginning there were, you could see drones in the sky every now and then, which would be, you know, military police drones kind of thing. Um, and you had like, obviously, we've got three different levels of police here and all of them are out on the streets. So it's it kind of a heavy wow. police presence, especially at the beginning. Um, funny thing, I got stopped in the first week by police for um, having two smaller rubbish containers that I was taking out of my house. <laughs> two police cars stopped me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking my rubbish out. And they said, well, the bag you're taking is too small. Uh, it doesn't warrant leaving your house for that much rubbish. Wow. So that really, like proper lockdown, like you got to... crazy. Yeah, exactly. That was that was at the beginning. It was really full on, and now they've eased it. We're allowed out for a little exercise, uh, so it's certainly got better. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because I was in I was in Barcelona for a job. Literally, I think it must have been. I think we were there 14, 15, 16th of um of March. Right. And it, it was. We literally flew out, flew back to to the UK the day before they announced. The, the you know proper lockdown yeah. but even yeah. then i mean it was still a bit you know like everywhere in the world i think it, they were still being a bit kind of brazen do you know what i mean like there was the odd mask yeah. stuff but i think everyone was a bit wary of it. you know even on the shoot people were going oh should we hug or no oh hello how's it going yeah. Not yeah. Sure, yeah. No, maybe not but no yeah i guess it must have gone straight into i'm pretty sure i spoke to some people from the shoot just after and they said yeah it went into like full you know, 28 days later, lockdown yeah. streets. Oh, which... yeah. It's crazy. The street, streets are amazing because they're completely, like, say, 28 days later, you know, it's completely empty. It looks beautiful, really, because you yeah. never see it like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, great, great. And uh, so how long have you lived in Spain? Because, you know, obviously, we've known each other for a long time and you were living in London, but you you moved yeah. out to Spain. Yeah, exactly. Well, I still, I mean, I've been back and forth. I've still got a place in London because I kind of, you know, the commercials works there. Um, and you know, all my friends and family are there, so I've still got a place there. Uh, but I've guess lived here for about five years. Um, but you know, always back and forth. And as you know, the job takes you all around the world anyway, so it's kind of like I say, this is my family home, like my base, but then everywhere else is you know, work basically. I think as long as you live near an airport, you're all good, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anywhere in the world, <laughs> yeah, great, great. So maybe we could just uh give the, the listeners like a quick like brief intro into like how you got to this point i mean it's a long story obviously but like did you do the kind of film school route or did you go assisting like how did you get into the into the cinematography yeah so i did a bit of both to begin with so i think my um the real start for me was at school when um when i was like say six, 16 um, I just went to um, a normal state school, but we were really lucky to have had a media grant about a year before I hit my uh, GMBQ level. Um, and they built these blue screen studios. I had loads of like VHS cameras, loads of editing equipment, kind of big influx of, of gear. And um, around that time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life, probably like a lot of teenagers. And all this stuff was happening at the school and I, I became very excited by it. Um, so I think that's when it really started my interest generally in filmmaking. Um, then by the time I was, you know, leaving school, uh, I decided I wanted to go to university and study film to continue it. Uh, so I did film production as a BA at uh, what's now known as Westminster Film School, but it was just university back then. Um, and we studied, I think almost exclusively, for the first year at least, was all film, it was all 16 mil. Uh, nice. Then, I mean, to be honest, for three years, it was largely film. 
and we did the occasional digital project. But the digital cameras then, they just weren't really, you know, the red hadn't even come out then. You know, this was like I graduated in 2005. Uh, so we had like a Sony 750. There was a 900. But we didn't use them because they weren't as good as film, you know. So that was that was one side of me starting out. And then the other side was as a trainee. Uh, so during that period, um, I was lucky enough to, to um, get on Ari Crew's books with Kate Collier as a trainee. And so that was able to get me on lots of different sets, uh, see other DPs work. And, um, you know, alongside me lighting my own little short films and kind of personal projects, I was able to see other people who were doing it properly. Um, so I guess, yeah, that was the beginning. Nice, nice. And then I know, I know because we, we know each other, but you kind of, you did kind of, you went into the cinematography route quite, you know, quite quickly and you wanted to, you knew exactly where you wanted to go and that kind of thing. So how did that kind of come about? Like, where did you, how did you do it? Well, I think it was a combination of things. I was, I was obsessive. That's the first, yeah. most important thing. So during yeah. university, you know, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I just kind of kept my mind completely just on that one thing was trying to learn as much about lighting and everything as possible. Um, but the other element was I was pretty cheeky because right at the beginning, especially when you're that young, people don't see you as a cinematographer. You know, even now I'd like to think I'm still young, but you know, <laughs> when you when you just graduate and you're 21, yeah, you know, you obviously look the age of a runner. You are the age of a runner. That's generally what people do. You know, to start out, and I was obviously training as well. Um, but when I say I was cheeky at that time, I was putting myself out there as a DP as well, and. Um, on one occasion, a funny anecdote was I, I had a friend who was a runner working at a, a commercials company in London. Um, and when they finished their working day, the office was closing down, but they had the keys to close the office. I just went to see them to say hello. Uh, and there was no one else in the office. And I knew being as that was a very successful commercials company, I thought what a great opportunity to kind of place my DP reels quite literally on their shelves because back then it was all dvds but this was all before the internet and instagram and everything so exactly i don't know if instagram even existed i yeah. don't uh, obviously the internet did but it certainly wasn't it was much more about your dvd show reel than it was about your website i might yeah. have had a basic website but i don't know if i did yeah, yeah um and it was all about you know on the production company shelves there was loads of dvds and directors, if they didn't already know who they wanted, they'd often go through the DVDs, pick one out and be like, let's have a look at this reel, you know? Yeah. So I knew that was how it worked. So I took, I think, five or ten, I can't remember, a little stack of DVDs with me. And, and no one was there except my friend. And I think he didn't even see me do it. But So I slipped them onto the shelf. Um, and then on the back of the – and this, so this reel was very basic. It, was, it just had my stuff from university, so like some shorts – some test commercials. So I, I, the other reason I was cheeky was I'd, I'd spend my own money to shoot test commercials on 35 mils. So tried to make them look like real ads yeah, yeah. and didn't say they were test commercials. You know, I had, had them finished properly and stuff. I had a friend who right. was a cameraist. And so that's a bit cheeky because really you're putting yourself out there as someone who shoots commercials. But really I was 21 and probably, I'd been on commercial sets, but I hadn't really ever got, you know, an APA commercial before. Um, and so, yeah, put that on the shelf. And on the back of the DVD, I put Kate Collier's uh, contact number, <laughs> Ari Crew. And at the time, she was, uh, you know, I was on her books, but as a camera trainee. Yeah, so yeah. again, that was very cheeky and really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, and a few weeks, didn't think anything of it. Probably did that with a number of different places. Um, a few weeks later, though, Kate gave me a call and she said, Kit, I think we've got a chat because uh, I've had a call from this production company and they'd like you to shoot a music video for them um but you know there's a problem because you know you're not a dp on my list so i don't <laughs> know what's going on here and then obviously i had to admit to her that i'd used her name uh, yeah. you know and really kind of shouldn't have done that um anyway at that point amazingly i did get the music video went really well but at the same time she said look i'm gonna have to take you off the books you know it wasn't the done thing to kind of yeah, yeah. They say you were a GP when you were, you know, I was, should have been working fully as a trainee. Anyway, so she took me off the books. I did the job. But amazingly, the production company were very happy with it. Yeah. They called her up afterwards, again, not even knowing I was over a trainee with her, and said how happy they were. Uh, she then called me back up. <laughs> said, maybe come in and we have a chat. 
And um, so I came in, she said, look, I've shown your reel around to other people. Um, and she she was really one of the people that gave me the biggest break because she said, you know, I think you, you've got a shot at it. And she then put me on the list as a DP. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, it's a long way around to say that, you know, I guess an obsessive nature, a cheeky nature, and then eventually a very big break with someone that helped me out and, and put me out there, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I guess if you don't put yourself out there, it's never going to happen, do you know what I mean? You can't sit and wait for it to come to you. You've got to go out there and grab it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Great. So then, and then did that that evolve, did it, did it happen instantaneously or did you kind of, was it then like a slow, gradual thing again of, of, of working more and more on different projects and building them up? Yeah, certainly. The, yeah, the second of the two. It's, it was really like, um, it was great starting out uh, with, you know, a couple of decent projects. I had that and they snowballed into other jobs with, you know, decent companies. But at the same time, I didn't have another job. You know, this was, it was that and traineeing. And obviously, when I was on the book as a DP, I couldn't trainee anymore because that's certainly a very odd thing to do. So um, I, you know, was doing every job possible just to pay my bills. You know, I lived in a shared flat and, um, you know, I do corporate videos. I do, uh, I never did wedding videos, to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, I do, I do interviews, just really small jobs, just, just yeah. to kind of pay the bills. Uh, and then at the same time, do the more creative projects, which at that time, you know, were more music videos um, or still short films, still shot a lot of shorts um so yeah definitely it was a process of building up and up slowly great yeah yeah and then and then how did um because when we started working together obviously i was an assistant you were you were DPing. i think this was probably about it was must have been like nine eight nine years ago now that yeah, we and it, i think it, exactly yeah. yeah and i think it, it was probably and thinking back it, i think one of the jobs we did might have actually been like my, one of my first ever commercials that we did oh. together that i think it was that gucci moccasin job maybe yeah, i remember it very well yeah, yeah. yeah. we had, i'm pretty sure we had about 20 20 something 10ks all pointed into the middle or that was like a handbag one there was like a <laughs> one we did just literally like and then there was this poor i can remember what was his name was his name matt the art, art, <laughs> Marston, yeah the props guy he's brilliant he's brilliant yeah, amazing like. props guy he's lit i can remember we had to like dress him in like reflective gear because he yeah. had to go inside and like Burn, burn your hand. I remember that. It was like an oven, literally. You put them on and it was burn your hand. We were, but because we were shooting such high frame rates, you know. On the Wiseman. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the HS2, which then yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of it. Yeah, I remember it. It's a funny job, that. And so, because I think it was like a native, like, wasn't it like 320 or something? I, ASA? I think, yeah, I guess it was. You know what? I can't remember, but that would make sense with the amount and, of. Yeah, they had to have so much light to get the stop and yeah. stuff. That, that, and at like a thousand frames or 800 or whatever we were shooting at but yeah anyway so that was with um with james fuller spun remain and you were kind of partly slightly involved with those guys and there was a there was a great little kind of run of i can remember we did loads of jobs together you know all these kind of gucci yeah. jobs um you know loads and loads of jobs that we did together how did that come about how did you meet those guys yeah, that was kind of like almost like a second wave of a break for me in a way. Because I guess before that, I'd done loads of work uh, with another production company called Irresistible Films for, let's say, for example, the first five years of starting out. And with a very, uh, one, one director in particular, Johnny Grant, who I worked every job he did, you know, I was shooting. He was so busy. Um, and then Johnny kind of wound down and just around that same time, Remain, who was my focus puller for years, and then James Fuller, who... I was a really close friend and um, a producer. They got together and said, look, you know, we want to make a production company uh, for fashion, strictly for fashion commercials. Um, and, you know, I was lucky enough to be right in there from the beginning and right. shooting everything for them and for, for, again, particularly director Remy. So that then became another okay, second wave of me in ads where it seemed to be all I did was their jobs. Um, and yeah, there was, it was a brilliant period. That's also about probably probably three to five years, I guess that lasted, you know, in, yeah. in total. Yeah, it must have been. Um, we yeah. did a lot, of, a lot of jobs during that time, which was great, you know. And they were all they were always very nice, fruitful jobs. I think. Yeah, <laughs> <probably different>. yeah <laughs> couple, exactly. couple of triple timers, definitely. In there. For sure. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah, great motion control jobs. That was the yeah. what, call it the overtime machine. Yeah. 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 That's great. No, I mean, and then did that. Did we, 
was fashion something that you, from the beginning, wanted to go into? Or was it just something that kind of came about with these guys? And Or was it something that you really kind of was like, yeah, I really want to hone in on that kind of fashion beauty aspect of things? Yeah, I think it's actually a bit of both, to be honest, because I think always, even from the university days, when I was looking at other DP's work, I was always interested in, uh, you know, hair and beauty wheels, because it's like they always look super high end. And especially when you're starting out, you look at that kind of work and you think, how do they do that, you know? Like I'm pointing a camera at something, someone's face against the white wall, and it doesn't look as nice as it does when, you know, John Perez does it or something. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, more and more just obsessing about how they do that, how they like that. And so I guess I was always really interested in, yeah, fashion and beauty, but particularly hair and beauty, um, because because of that high end production value. And so yeah, it was definitely something I wanted to get into, but I think one of multiple elements of of commercials generally you know because there's obviously so many other you know like for example cars packs stuff which requires so much specific lighting detail yeah definitely. yeah yeah no it's great and i think i think you definitely carved the path for yourself in that kind of fashion and I, I think it was nice that we weren't it wasn't always kind of just beauty i think some of the fashion jobs that we did in that time were very you know they had a bit more of narrative like narrative kind of yeah. to sometimes which was really nice to them so yeah great yeah I mean, and now, would you would you say the bulk of your you've kind of moved away from commercial slightly, and you're focusing more on features? Is that would that, would that be correct? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't it wasn't strictly a deliberate move because it was more just that, as with lots of parts of the industry, once you start doing one thing more, everyone thinks that's what you do and stops calling you for the thing you did before. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, it could be. Uh, you know, I start doing fashion commercials, they stop calling me for, you know, pack shots or something. Yeah. But in this case, it was like I did I did a, my first feature and it really broke out. And then I kept doing films and still do. And it's like, obviously, the films take up a lot of your time. So you're then out of commercials for that amount of time. However, I certainly haven't stopped shooting ads. And, you know, I keep doing them between the films, you know. So whenever I'm not then doing a film, the great thing is I still get calls for ads, you know, um, and love doing them, you know. Yeah, I think I can remember you saying one time that you found that when you started doing the features more, the calls for the ads started, like, going up in a level. Did you? I think, it, yeah. That's true. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've noticed that again more and more recently, because I guess once the films become to the level where people recognise, for example, the talent involved, um, and let's say they've seen it on Netflix, or even they might have seen it in the cinema, if I'm lucky, then suddenly, I guess your name's associated with a bigger production. And yeah. therefore, yeah, like say, I was getting calls for, I guess, bigger ads or... Um, you know, maybe more, not necessarily giant scale ads, but maybe more stuff where you know they do everything properly. You yeah. know, there's, there's so many, such a big tier of doing commercials and understandably people have to cut corners sometimes, but it's nice when you're on ones when they just go, no, this is the right way to do it and we do it like that, you know. It's quite, it's quite interesting though, because you, you know, as a DP myself and other people I think might have the impression that, you know, to get higher in the commercial game, you should just keep shooting commercials and you should just stick to commercials and build up that ladder. And then they think, oh, you know, that sometimes there's a there's a an aura of like these are the commercials guys and these are the features guys. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. that people think that there are the two worlds. And I think within the crew sector, maybe there are two kind of worlds. But I guess you know it just shows that with with DPing, you you it doesn't matter which kind of route you go down. You're you, you're hopefully going to still get calls for for the whole variant of work. I mean, okay, yeah. what about what about music videos? I mean, we've we worked on a couple of music videos together. Do you still get calls for music videos or less and less? Yeah, I'd say zero, like in years. <laughs> yeah, I just don't get calls for them to be honest. And I think you know I don't put myself out there for them. Um, I really enjoy I've done absolutely loads of promos and I really enjoy doing them but I have to say these days you know it's a whole different ball game shooting a promo because you know really the thing is it's it's about being able to get you know from my point of view the most beautiful images possible yeah and the time you're allowed and the money you have right and obviously in promos it's still that but the time you have is less and the money you have is less so therefore, like in order to, the way I always see it is, can I put this project on my show really? Is this something that I can put out there and be proud of? Yeah. And, you know, when the budgets are really constrained, 
there's got to be some other great reasons for me to want to do that. Do you know what I mean? And obviously with promos, you kind of think, you know, if you've done yourself, that, kind of, that kind of money, time, you know, outcome of, you know, effort and all that kind of triangle and you're never going to get them all into one triangle do you know what i mean uh, no certainly not and i think promos is the hardest space to do them but at the same time create some brilliant work you know it's like certainly how i started had loads of people start and i think it's um you know I, i'm certainly never say never like if i got a call for one great director behind it and it looked like a really cool project yeah. I'd be up for it, but I don't get the calls, you know. So no, 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 I think I think they are definitely the the place and the scope to, you know, experiment with lighting, particularly and you know, and camera movement. Do you know what I mean? Like you can you can definitely have a lot of fun on music videos, but they are, you know, the ones where you can do that and do it effectively are you know far and few between. It's it's yeah. tough to it's tough to find the yeah. experimental ones with a big budget. But yeah. yeah. So what what was the? Can you remember the first? kind of drama or you know feature that you really did that was you know before yeah. obviously I know that you you the first kind of breakthrough you mentioned already was kind of under the shadow which was you know, you know that first feature that you kind of said but going back before that what was the first kind of drama feature that you kind of got paid yeah. on do you know what I mean yeah yeah, yeah. so the very first one was called dub plate drama um which was in two, th I shot series two. So Damien Bromley shot the first series. I shot the second series. And I think it was 2006 or 2007. So it was very shortly after I graduated. Okay. Uh, and that was, yeah, that's a proper job. It was 12 episodes, so 30 minute episodes, all for Channel 4 at prime time, shown at 10 p.m. Okay. at night on a Thursday or something. You know, it's a good slot. Um, so that was definitely my first proper drama job, but it was also incredibly low budget. So you know, that was like really trying to kind of squeeze whatever we could out of it. But I have to say, I'm still very proud of that. You know, it's... And I, it, it, for people who don't know, I think it was like a, wasn't it like a kind of music slash urban street kind of drama about yeah. teenagers? Had, exactly a music, that. had a music element to it. Because I think like Daffy was in it, wasn't he? Daffy was in it. All of those, that were, Talisa was in it. It was her first acting role ever. Um, uh, Big Nasty, who's now doing well, you know, he was in wow, it. Yeah. Um, who else? Shiesty, you know, who was, she was the lead really. And so it was, it was about a girl, Shiesty, who was trying to make it in that world of, uh, you know, urban rap. Yeah. And, things. and so, yeah, it involved a lot of, of uh, music performance as well as the drama, yeah. And how did that, how did that project like come to you? How, what, because obviously you're straight out of, you know, well, early out of uni, yeah. you know, you were like, you were saying you would, you've got your reel that you're, you know, pumping around. How did that this project come to you? Yeah, so that was at the time. So I had a friend from university called Patrick Fisher, who's now a very successful producer. He um, knew Luke Hines and Louis Figgis. Luke was a creator and director, writer. Louis was a producer. Uh, he knew them through, I can't remember, some work he'd done with them anyway. Uh, early on, he said um, they had a music video for Sonny J. Mason, I remember. We shot 16 mil. And, uh, yeah, so I basically got the link with Luke and uh, Louis through that music video. Uh, nice. And then within maybe a couple of months of that video coming out, they said, look, we've got this drama. Um, obviously, they'd already shot one series, and I think Damien wasn't available for the second series. And I guess, you know, we got along really well shooting the music video together. And, um, yeah, Luke, Luke and Louis asked me to do the, the drama. Um, but, you know, it was a tough process because, you know, like I said, very low budget and I was still very green. And so, you know, they, they'd worked with someone more experienced than me on the first series. Uh, my process for lighting was entirely uh, lighting for film. You know, I used my meter for everything. And this was an entirely digital video project, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which, to be honest, I wasn't as used to. You know, I'd overexpose highlights and stuff, which is horrible to do on video you know back then when it, when it couldn't retain the detail yeah, so yeah. you know we had a couple of sit downs i remember early first week of production they sat me down and they, they weren't too sure about how i was lighting you know they didn't i don't think they particularly liked it um and they did keep saying look you shoot film more don't you you know and i was like yeah this is <laughs> a new <laughs> brand for me uh but then i think we settled in but yeah it was it was it was a tough job because i was so new to it you know it's good to learn i guess you know a learning curve and it's good they didn't just kick you out kick you out first yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah 
Great. And then, so then that was obviously the first thing. And then Under the Shadows, like how did that, um, Under the Shadows, sorry, with, with Babak, how did that yeah. come? So, yeah, we shot that 2015. So that's, yeah, 10 years after I graduated. Um, and throughout that entire time, I'd always said that the first film I wanted to do was going to be with Balak, who um, I went to university with. So I met him in 2002. We studied together. We did every, you know, little short together and things. Yeah. Um, and I waited until his film was ready to go before I, I did a film, basically. You know, there were some other minor offers maybe, but, you know, nothing that I was going to do. So... The reason that was my first is I wanted it to to be his film, um, and yeah, it came back because we know each other. You happy with that decision? Waiting? You like did it? Did it, it paid off? I guess. Yeah, for sure, paid off. Because I think the thing is, when your first film is that successful, um, it's it's a pretty good calling card, you know. Yeah. Whereas I guess if I'd have done, let's say, five films before that, but they'd have all been not very successful, and then my sixth film is that, you know, then you go well you're putting out a lot of unsuccessful films as well. Yeah. So, you know I mean? like it's, you know, your ratio is not very high, whereas if it's one-to-one, -one, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And he he wrote, directed, kind of, yeah. he, you know, he pulled the project together and you guys obviously had known each other. And how long did that kind of, obviously you were, you know, you'd known each other from university for 10 years. You kind of, mm -hmm. I'm imagining you'd seen this project kind of slowly. Exactly, from a paragraph, from, yeah. From like his head into this like production. Yeah. How long, what was the kind of, when was the first time he actually, you know, said to you, you know, I've got the idea. Yeah, yeah uh, probably, probably, uh, I guess, 18 months, two years before we shot it, maybe even longer to be fair. But the, the process, um, you know, I was involved with from the beginning to the extent where it's literally a paragraph, we discuss it in the pub, uh, yeah. to, to then going on to like, I helped do concept art with him. So we do f photography and, you know, Photoshop together images so we could do concept art for the package. I helped put together the initial package before we had proper producers on board. Um, my sister uh, did all the fine art concept for them. Um, excuse me, she's a fine art substitute. So, so, yeah, you know, I was very involved right from the beginning from when it was just like, a, you know, a concept. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. You got really, you know, you could see it through right, right through to the end. Yeah. And then you guys, you guys shot out in Jordan. Is that correct? That's what yeah. I can remember. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, again, tough at times. But, I mean, yeah, we shot there because... So so the film is based in uh, Tehran in the late 70s, early 80s, in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and when Babak first saw Jordan, parts of Jordan, um, he said it was the thing that most reminded him of of, the, of Tehran, of his home city, you know, um, especially at that time. So it was a perfect place to shoot for the exteriors and also even the interiors, which is largely based in... Um, just were more, uh, I guess, for him, reminiscent of of his own house, you know, because it's very much based on his childhood. Um, but yeah, shooting there in regards to like the practicalities in some ways was great and actually a lot better than shooting in the UK because, for example, on that budget, you know, it's a sub $1 million budget. Right. Um, on that budget, you can do a hell of a lot more for your money in Jordan than you can in the UK. You know, like a hell of a lot more. We had two jennies every day. I was running around 200 kilowatts of light every single day. Um, we wrapped the house in, in um, big tents, two-story house, you know, knocked through walls, um, had a number of sparks. You know, we had decent teams. So just, uh, just a quick overview, I, you know, for the people listening, it's, a, it's obviously a film about a family who lived during this time of the Iraq-Iran war. And there's, you know, the bombing going on in Tehran. And it, it kind of, the film turns into this kind of, psychological kind of horror i'd say you know yeah i mean what, what, what's your kind of take on it yeah that's ex exactly it yeah so it's, it's, it's a family drama you know it's focused on the relationship between the mother father and the child yeah and when the father goes to war it's about the relationship between the mother and the daughter and how that descends from something which was very kind of domestic and what we i guess consider traditional uh to something much more horrific which arguably is just psychological um, yeah. but because of what's going on outside the house it then impacts and comes within the house and we and between them and and, and kind of i'd say 75 percent of it is set with inside this yeah. apartment in exactly. this house was, exactly. that, was that did you guys shoot in a in a real house or was it a set build or how was yeah. that so, so we shot in a real house uh, but it was across two different houses 
um, so for different elements of the house. And I think the key thing from my point of view was that we tented the entire house um, so that I could shoot day, night, different times of day uh, with just, you know, just on the dimmer desk basically. So everything was lit within the tent and we built a separate garden within the tent so you can look out the windows and see a garden. Wow. Uh, big, big and tent. It was, yeah, it was 1.5 miles of ultra bounce that they ordered <laughs> And then they sewed it together for about two days. So there was guys just there, like multiple sewing machines, and they just sewing it all these sewing machines for days before they put it up um, and wrapped it around. Then I had loads of like dinos and stuff inside the tent. So there was we were burning about two hundred kilowatts a day, uh, you know, at all every time because Lubbock wanted these really long shots throughout the house. So yeah. we'd be able to see all the different rooms in one shot. Which, funny enough, they end up cutting up, but we did them in oneers. Right and. Um, for that, obviously, every room needs to be lit and it needs to be continuous, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, so there's, there's quite a few times when you are seeing out the window and you can see kind of, you know, lamp posts or something out the window or sky or yeah. a bit of that. And you said you, you actually built stuff within the tent. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So there was like garden features anyway, obviously, within the hat, within the structure of the yeah. house and its grounds. Uh, but we, because we then put the tent around everything, we then had to put back in foliage and you know elements that give it depth within that kind of white space you know and did you with it so did you have the ultra you didn't have the ultra bounce pointing white in it was white out no it's white in white in okay so then when you did the yeah. night one, you would just kind of bounce a bit of light off that just yeah it's funny you can say that because the gaffer also was confused why i would do white in. Well, everyone was confused why i was doing white in but i wanted so the roof and the back was white everything so that basically when it was night you could put on one lamp over Dino, yeah. you know, or Maxi or wherever it is, and then you'd you'd have a really subtle fill around. You put a little blue gel in front of it, whatever it might be, but you know, you can very quickly go to a low level, but still, let's see trees or something within it. Because what I have a, a pet hate about it is that when you see a window and it's just black, yeah, because it's like yeah, you do see that in reality, but it's not as interesting as if you put some layers in there, you know. One hundred percent, and I mean, I think it does work well. I mean, obviously. I guess then there's like you, when you do see out a window, you don't have to like green screen it or anything. You're right. just looking into a. I mean, because the, it's the the apartment is set quite high up in the building, so it's okay. not like you're seeing trees or other buildings. You're just seeing into the white sky, mm -hmm. you know, around, which is great. Yeah, no, I think it worked really well. Interesting that you guys did that way because yeah, I would have you know the usual way is just black bolt and and just bolt yeah. the whole thing. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, that's, yeah. But then for the daylight, obviously, then you want the white and like say yeah. you want you know. Um, and I wanted it super soft as well because our references were like um, our key reference was a separation uh, in Iranian film, which won the Oscar actually that year, best film film, um, and that was very it's very softly lit. It's very like um, so that you can travel through the space and so that it feels real, you know. So yeah, that's the same kind of thing with us. We wanted it to look kind of real, really, and, and face soft, yeah. And I, I think that really works well with when the, you know, when the film starts taking more of like a surreal turn, you know, you're not in this kind of heightened world. You're yeah. in more of a, and, it, and it definitely, you know, it, it shocks you a bit more. Do you know what I mean? It lets those, you, you're, you're less expectant of something coming out. You know, it definitely yeah. didn't have that kind of horror look do you know what i mean to it it definitely has much more real natural kind of look to it and then these kind of things start happening within the apartment which you yeah know, which which stand out a lot more and shock you a lot more when it when they do come for sure so, yeah and that was always babak's plan you know it's like like you say keep it feeling real so that people connect to it more yeah yeah i mean what were the other you mentioned the separation but what other kind of references did you guys look at for the for the film uh rosemary's baby uh for sure there's that other Polanski film where he's, she's trapped in a flat one. Um, oh, hang on, yeah. There's a great one, which is, I love it, the reference. I really should remember it. <laughs> um, he, he, uh, yeah, Bowick's got like an encyclopedic knowledge of films. And so his references span so many different genres of things. And sometimes it'll be that he's looking at a very specific part of a film um uh, you know and it can be a reference to that and then it'll give me a reference to something else which would be a completely different kind of film but will have again he's taken out a little element from it you know yeah. it's about trying to put them all together and um you know primarily understand what he wants from all these things but then yeah again get them on the screen yeah 
Great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it, and it, it, it was a, it was a big success, I guess, the film. Do you know what I mean? For both, for, you know, it, was it was it Babak's first feature himself? Or had, 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 he, had he done shorts before this, obviously? We did a short before. Well, we'd done multiple shorts, but the key short for us was called Two and Two, which was, again, a Farsi film, um, which I actually co-produced with him because I just wanted to get it off the ground so much. And yeah. we ended up shooting it in the university I studied in, but much after university. I think we shot in 2011. And, um, that one uh, was nominated for Best Short Film at the BAFTAs. Okay. And that was in 2012, we got the nomination. And after that, he then got a lot of interest. He got a very good agent and was able to get, you know, put in touch with good producers and things. And then by 2015, we were doing Under the Shadow, yeah. Nice, nice. And he he actually went on to win, uh, what was it, Best Outstanding it, Newcomer, it, was it? Two, yeah, Outstanding British Debut. And... Yeah. Um, Put it here. Outstanding British film and outstanding British for the for the director, writer, producer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So and that was at the BAFTAs. So it's you know yeah. uh, incredibly proud moments. And I think you know, like say, obviously for Bob, I can credit for what both of us, all of us involved. And then you know that leads on to lots of other stuff because suddenly you're getting calls and stuff you never otherwise would. You know. And I think like did that was the same for you? Was it was it? Uh, did you feel? Uh, was it a sudden shift in like the the calls you were getting, or was it was it again a gradual shift? And I guess I can imagine you carried on in the commercials world that you were still in, but you definitely felt like a big shift in the kind of calls you were getting from your agent. Yeah, I'd say so, definitely. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a shift. I think it's a shift in in terms of what they can put you forward for, because you know once you've got something that's really well recognised, it's a much easier sell, you know. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it was very low budget. It's not like you generally see people jump from something that low budget to something very big budget, you know? Yeah. You still got to prove yourself as you kind of work your way up those tiers. So, um, you know, it, the calls were obviously were getting more and I had other projects, but it was like still lower budget films, you know what I mean? Still working way up. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. And then you moved on. You did, I think you did, looking here, you did um, a project called Possum, which was, yeah. you know, with... Um, What's his act, actor's name? Sean, Sean Harris and Alan Armstrong. Harris, yeah, from from the Mission Impossible series and all yeah. those. You know. yeah. And uh, I can remember. Obviously, at this point, I think I'd started shooting slightly more. Yeah. And yeah. but you were still working with, um, you know, one of our good friends, Ralph Messer, who's you know, yes, your, of course, your, your focus puller. So yeah. I was definitely hearing some of the interesting stories, and he's definitely like a a yeah. method actor. Exactly, his method, and that's a very polite way to say it. And he's a brilliant <laughs> actor. And I learned a hell of a lot from that film um, and watching it perform, you know, and I was really lucky with that film because uh, I love the director, Matt Holness. Um, he's just such a creative guy, such a nice guy, just brilliant with with um, crews, incredibly creative. Yeah. You know, he, he was just a great person to work with. Um, and it was so, so that in itself was was one element of the film, you know, shooting the film was, you know, brilliant with Matt. And then obviously you've got the other element, which is Sean, who was the lead, who is, you know, a, an amazing professional. He's been in so many good films. He's always superb on screen, uh, you know, but he does have his own way of working and you just have to work with that. You know, that's he's, he's the star. So, yeah. yeah. And you and you shot that on 35. Is that correct? Yeah, that's 35. And I think, again, lucky to be able to do that for a low budget. Again, that was just under a million, I think. Okay. And, you know, so we're limited on stock and things, but um the way matt shoots is very precise you know he knows exactly what he wants very little coverage per scene lots of long takes as well and what i mean by that is the scene might be covered in one yeah. take you know so you don't need lots of stop really as long as you don't, don't do many takes um and sean's superb as is alan armstrong of course yeah so it's not like you're going again for performance do you know what i mean and you don't need to go again for for us because ralph's brilliant focusing yeah. <laughs> um you know, so so yeah, we we got away with it basically on thirty five. Yeah. And what was the was the was that a thing that came from you, or was it a collaborative thing from you and the director after discussions? It was it was both. I mean, Matt had shot um, you know a lot on sixteen before, and he loved film, and yeah. all of his references were film. It was supported by the BFI who loved film. So you know, it was very much began from Matt's side, and then obviously I was pushing it because I love film and. Uh, 
again, like I said, all of his references were on 35. So it was like, it seemed a no brainer. It's like, if you want it to look like that, we use that format, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. Cool. And then, and then after that, you kind of moved on and you've, you've done a couple of projects recently. Um, one being, you know, Eternal Beauty, which you did recently. Yeah. And also, uh, Shadow in the Cloud as well, which were both had, um, you know, great actors linked to them and they were were they were they both one i know shadow in the cloud was shot in new zealand where yeah. was and was eternal beauty was all in wales uh, okay. there's another there's another couple of films in there farming and wounds yeah. yeah yeah and then how so how did how do you feel like that's kind of your your feature work has developed into obviously you know eternal beauty was starring sally hawkins who you know yeah. i think she just come up was it was it she just had or was just coming off of kind of um Shape Shape of Water. Water. Yeah. yeah she she it, it, um she was in that whole oscars kind of run you know when they do all the pr for it yeah and it was in one of her interviews on that that she said that they said what's your next project and she said it's eternal beauty with craig roberts and at this point this story is that she wasn't officially signed on i, I think uh so that was the first craig craig told me that's the first he'd known for sure that she was doing it <laughs> um, watched, watched it on the news and thought oh, yeah news, yeah <laughs> yeah she's just superb i mean on another note sally is uh an absolutely incredible actress who is also an incredible person and um you know a, a really a joy to work with yeah you couldn't hope for more yeah yeah. yeah. Well, maybe well, maybe just talk about the film a little bit. Like, what's it what's it about then? That one. I haven't actually seen that film. I'm no, sure. it's not. It's not. It's not released yet. So unless okay. you saw it at the festival, because it was it was London Film Festival, the only place you'd have seen it so far. I think maybe one other. Um, but yes, hopefully coming out after the after lockdown is lifted. Yeah. Um, so it's about Sally plays a paranoid schizophrenic, and it's kind of a, a drama about the relationship and dynamic within her family within with her sisters uh, mother and father and um ultimately a, a partner a boyfriend who's played by mike thulis um david thulis sorry his character name is mike but his, <laughs> his real name is david thulis who's again superb actor um and yeah it's just it's basically like following her journey and struggles with mental health issues um but it also has and this is key is it's got a comic take on a lot of it okay. um and that's not poking fun at her it's kind of going along with her and the way craig did that was that he based a lot of it on his auntie sally's character is based on his real life auntie and a lot of the comedy elements that came through was discussions that he'd had with his auntie that he put directly into the film you know so it was you know, it's it's a kind of fine line between looking at it where you see films about people with mental health issues are often very sensitive. And this yeah. is sensitive to the extent because it's real, but otherwise it's not it's not looking at her and feeling sorry for her, you know? Yeah. It's actually yeah. empowering her. And and some people when they watch it don't quite understand that because you kind of look at it and think it's a comedy, but it's about someone with schizophrenia. So how are we meant to be taking this? Am I meant to laugh at this? Um, and I think it's uh, something funny enough that early on, Craig told me that when I went for the interview, because I didn't know him before this, um, he said I was one of the few people that came into the interview and said, I loved how funny it was. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he said a lot of people didn't, I guess, dare say it was funny because because you're not meant to. But it is it's a very funny film. And um, anyway, point being is that, uh, yeah, that came about through yeah, just interviews and yeah. Right. And again, you shot, the, you shot that on film as well, but obviously it's maybe slightly more budget in this one now. Yeah, a bit more money, but um, yeah, still, you know, you're always up against it. But yeah, that was 35 as well, yeah. And also, and also supported by the BFI. Okay, yeah, nice. And all these films, they have, they're, you know, they've got similar elements to them, but, you know, there's Under the Shadow, which is very, you know, set in a completely different country with, you know, that kind of horror aspect. Farming, which, you know, we haven't spoken about yet, but was, you know, kind of about skinheads and that kind of thing and then you've got this film eternal beauty which had you know had the comic value and aspects do you when you come to a film and you read a script what kind of approach do you take in terms of you know prepping yourself and 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 getting your ideas to the director like how do you how do you personally do that 
Yeah, really good question. I think I think I'm still honing it because obviously you do, you know, a number of interviews and meetings with films and stuff, and especially when you don't know the director, you, you know, you've got to go to your first. Well, in my opinion, you've got to go to your first meeting with a good amount of prep and a good amount of ideas to give them, so that they look at you and go, okay, this guy is interested in the film and he understands the film, you know. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of like how I go about that. I always start obviously with the script and breaking down the script. Um, I break it down often in two ways, one of which is by just looking at the story and character elements, and then the other of which is looking at logistical and technical things. For example, locations, I'm very keen on breaking down everything in terms of like uh, interior, exterior, day, night, and I do a long list of that, and then it helps me get my mind kind of straight as to you know, how the thing's going to be lit practically, you know, but then I've then got to connect that to the story and, and the characters, obviously. Um, so they're the two kind of key elements. Then I always get visual references together, um, you know, which you don't always get an opportunity to show, to be honest. It's, it just depends on the director or the producer if they really want to see stuff like that. Yeah, in the first meeting, they don't always ask, you know, but you've you got to have it there just in case. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, no, normally read the script at least twice before going in. You know, it's not always, you don't always get a lot of time from when you get a call to when you've got the meeting, it might be a week, you know. So within yeah. that time, you know, reading it twice isn't isn't loads for the same time, along with all the prep you might do. And if you've got another job on, you might be shooting a commercial at the same time. So, um, yeah, I guess really it's just about doing as much research into the, you know, script as possible. And I know, I know from knowing you that you're, you are, you like to be quite, you know, prepped and, you know, lighting plans and kind of have documents made and that kind of thing. And you, I know you like to kind of experiment with different kind of techniques at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It work. I know you, you know, like, I can remember oh, talking right. to you before and you'd have like a little mini kind of studio built with like little dados and stuff to yeah. try different things on, Very much. Yeah. on packs and stuff. Do you, um, I mean, it, that that do you find that that helps you and and when you're in in terms of like once you've got the feature in it you know you're there with the, in the prep do you like to light and plan everything I mean have all the yeah, films yeah. done that so far yeah I do I do it more and more in fact every project I do now I try and do even more detail on so like every film for sure always light and plans every scene but nowadays for the last three films I've used. Um, a lot of computer software to do the plans and I it's always in 3D and uh you know they're getting more and more detailed really and I love that because you know they're getting to the extent where I can show an image to a director and it'd be completely in the 3D space and it'll be pretty realistic you know and be like this is how it's going to look uh and that's great because you get sign-offs before you step on set um, and then it's also great because if you use you know physically based objects in that 3D space you know, for example, I can put a technocrane in the space and it'll be exactly to the millimeter correct, uh, you know, field of view, perspective, everything's correct, you know. And so it's really useful for crew, for my gaffer, you know, for even for laying cable. Do you know what I mean? You've got a studio diagram. I can show you where the wall is going to come out. We know where the wall has to go after it's come out. If it's a small space, yeah. um, let alone where the lights are hung. So, yeah, I get more and more detailed every project and I'm going to keep doing so. so. <laughs> Soon you'll just be, like, hiring a studio to, like, yeah. build it, build it, pre-build it, and then get everyone to come down and be like, so we're just going to... We've done it already, guys. Don't worry. Just Let's just shoot it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, you find, do you find that that helps? Um, obviously, you know, you, some of your projects you, you've shot away. You know, you've just shot in, in New Zealand. And you were shooting in Wales. And I know Possum was... Wasn't that... It's somewhere else as well. Norfolk, that, yeah, it's Norfolk, yeah. yeah. So obviously it's tough to get, you know, I know Ralph comes with you a lot as, you, as, his, as your first AC, but not out to New Zealand. And yeah. the gaffer as well is probably even harder to, you know, get them, yes, convince them to yeah, take yeah. them with them. Do you find that that level of prep really helps with crew? I'd say so, yeah. Because, you know, if you're able to show something in real detailed plans, especially to gaffers and grips, you know, when you've got, say, the one in New Zealand, you know, it's a big job in scale because we had it was, it was a world war ii film and there was loads of action sequences loads of stunt rigging people on wires explosions it was all about planes fighting each other in the sky so you had big sets on gyros you know it was an incredibly technical job and so obviously when you've got all of that in my 
world in the computer and I can show, you know, exact 3D dimensions of things and where the light's going to go, where the screen's going to be hung and everything, um, it's very helpful. You know, it's, it's a much better level than if it's on a piece of paper, for example, because, you know, the piece of paper is one, you know, it's, it's one perspective. One I can do a yeah. front, right, left, top, but I can't do all of them. I can't turn them around live, you know, so it's it's very helpful, yeah. Excellent. And then, so let's talk maybe a little bit about that. And this, this project in New Zealand, um, Shadow in the Clouds, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. What? Where, so you was that re, that was quite recently, wasn't it? Maybe yeah. We literally finished the grade. I I, I left New Zealand uh, during the lockdown because I couldn't. I was only just about to get back to Spain because they just started shutting the borders. So that was the grade. Uh, obviously, we shot um, before that last May June. I think we finished last June. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of posts. There's 420 VFX shots with full like monster creation it's all wetter who did lord of the rings okay so it's kind of, it a very full-on post-heavy job uh with a lot of action and stuff yeah and what's a little brief rundown of that of that film then um so it's it's about uh a female fighter pilot in world war ii and her internal struggles with a male uh very macho crew on board a flight uh and as as the film progresses she becomes more, um, I guess, in turmoil emotionally and psychologically because of the kind of, I guess, bullying she's receiving from them. And uh, from that becomes a, more of a horror film, really. And it descends into an action horror uh, involving a gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> Gremlins on a plane. It's basically, it's basically that, yeah. And this, so this film, you know, it, it had what was the studio behind it? Was a was there a big studio attached? Yeah, it's, there? It's, it's a Hollywood film. Yeah, it's got, they're called Endeavor, and um, I think they were part of WME, or they are. It's you know, it's, it's, it's like a, an American finance studio picture. Yeah, and a much bigger, much bigger budget than. And... Yeah, it's the biggest film I've done for sure, and you know, biggest scale. We ended up with three units by the end of it. Um, big stand stages, and you know, the set builds were crazy. Big, amazing designer. Yeah. lighting structures you know everything about it was just bigger and bigger scale and obviously having wet on board and these you know super high-end vfx um was great as well for me because you know you see a lot and the vfx super was an absolutely lovely man um who i learned a lot from as well you know yeah i guess you guys got along quite well with your 3d models yeah well i think it's with those guys funnily enough i didn't i don't put much out there because it's like you know i do it for myself and for to show the gaffer sometimes show directors but, you know, when you talk to someone from Weta who's done it, it's their whole career. You don't want to be like, this is what I did. You know, I mean, it's like it's a different level. So Slightly uh, slightly like, hey, look at my little drawing, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. A giant drawing. Yeah. <laughs> and that, so a lot of those kind of, you, you mentioned there was a lot of um, fighter plane footage that you guys were shooting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, did you, and then you mentioned kind of screams briefly. Did I hear that? You were, so did yeah. you? kind of go into the world that, you know, has been seen a lot recently with, you know, Mandalorian using a lot of huge screens and these kind of screen tanks. Were you guys shooting shooting that in that kind of sense? Yeah, so we were we were actually, obviously, before Mandalorian, before the LED kind of interactive uh, thing was, like, fully took off, because I looked into a lot of LED projections and walls and stuff, but it wasn't quite there for what we needed. It was incredibly expensive. Yeah. And I was getting told to cut down wherever possible. But what we ended up with was far from cheap, which was basically, I think it was 12 in the end, big, big 20,000 lumen projectors, all rigged uh, above so this pod. So a lot of the film takes place in this one element of the plane where okay. Chloe Grace Moretz is, um, where she's you know got her guns and whatever inside this part of the plane. So when you look out the windows... What we did was uh, they built us an infinity psych exactly to spec from scratch. It's incredible to watch that guy. I think I got a little time lapse of them making it over the couple of weeks, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that wraps the entire studio walls with the psych. And then they rigged above that like 10 projectors. I think it's 10 yeah, above it. And then we had two below or something. Projectors, which then, uh, yeah, projected into the psych. Yeah. Um, and... It was seen together, obviously. I found a guy, amazing guy in New Zealand called Scott, who did all this uh, projection work for live 
events and stuff like human right. side events so he, he did all that and then we went out and did a number of days of aerial photography and then we projected the live images on on the site so as you look out of the windows you see it really yeah uh, but then the also the beauty of that method was that when weather didn't want the live images sometimes say for example you've got a monster on the side of the plane or you've got other planes and stuff and they want it blue or green screen we can just flick to blue or green screen and then everything becomes blue or green through, or, through the projectors straight through the projectors through the project, everything yeah and it's all gridded and like locked it was brilliant yeah, yeah. And you, you didn't have to have someone with a stick trying to put tracking markers up on the on no the it funny enough, the, the effect supervisor did that sometimes for specific shots he had different markers but he also had a grid laid out which was like obviously a digital grid that he could rescale yeah. across the whole board uh, but sometimes you put separate markers i guess there are depth markers between yeah. the plane and the grid and you know nice and did you did you find yourself was the the projection uh enough for lighting wise or did, did you like no, no no i did lots of tests and we couldn't because obviously it's 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 bounce light mm. um you know and also if you want it it's like when you look at a real sky if you expose to the sky you can't you can't get the face as well inside a capsule which is completely masked yeah. So we then I then had like um, four loads, 16 or something, uh, S60s, the sky panels around the top. Another, I think there's like 30 sky panels, something all through different levels of uh, diff, some of them hard, and then they would be synced with the projector um, so that they would create the cloud effects. Um, they'd create like moving effects. So basically, if we wanted to move the pod, it would be on gyros, but then I could move the pod through the light. So I could have the gyro go like this, the camera can just do a little move, but I can complete the move with the light, you know, because I can spin yeah, the, yeah. The, um, you know, the S60 patterns. Um, and that was all again previous. I did that all in, in the computer before. Um, and I've got so, and I can't release obviously now, but I've got so many behind the scenes bits of that, plus what the whole process. So it's quite interesting technically, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely the, this kind of projector or LED screen, you know, world is definitely going to be something that's going to take off for sure. Be a, be a part of, you know, our work in the future. You know, I think yeah. that's some of the work that I've been seeing, you know, from like Mandalorian or other projects like that, yeah. that, that, you know, as that, you know, like you said, it was very expensive, but I'm sure, you know, like anything, it's all going to just become more available and cheaper. And you know. Yeah. It's still going to be about the asset creation though. And the, oh. you know, it's like what's on the screen still costs a load of money you know and so really it's about getting that work cheaper before it can become available because the screens themselves might be available but you know what you're looking at if it's a piece of sky it's all right but as soon as it's buildings or you know even a desert and trees yeah. landscapes it's you've got to create it and that that is expensive. i mean i definitely found that i don't know have you have you seen mandalorian yourself yeah i've seen a little bit yeah okay yeah. i mean i did, i watched it and i could see from episode one to episode, you know, 10, I feel like they, they realized, or, you know, I don't, you know, this might be completely untrue, but this is how I saw it, that they, they started to amp up the kind of set within the kind of pod that they had. And I think that is definitely how it needs to be. You know, you can't just rely on the screen. Like you said, there needs, like, with all the films that you've mentioned today, you know, there needs to be that kind of depth, you know what I mean? Like, you can't just shoot into black out of, out of a night sky yeah. window. It just doesn't look right. You need you need some kind of depth. You you know, like in, it, out of the pod of the sky, you need you know there needs to be some kind of depth to it. And I think that's definitely where it's going to become. You know, you still need to build a set within the sky. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay, man. Well, yeah. I mean, it's been really good chatting to you. I mean, is there what have you got? Like, obviously, we're still in lockdown at the moment, yeah. but it's great that you managed to like get that project kind of just I mean, finished, did you finish, did you finish the grade just so i had to leave three days before the official end of it okay. um and now they're going to add another two days not with me because even by the end they hadn't quite wrapped it up it's two weeks um so i did some feedback stuff but yeah it's pretty much done yeah okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and anything anything else kind of was there anything teetering on the pipeline when when we went into lockdown yeah a couple of projects and there's still a couple that are quite possible around the end of the year and if fingers crossed um you know if we come out of lockdown at the right time i'll be able to start prep on something yeah um 
So, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. That'd be great, man. All right. Well, thank you so much for chatting. I mean, it's been great. Oh, you know, cool. obviously, yeah. I think we could go on for ages talking about yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. projects, but I mean, I think we'll, we'll, we'll make a part two at some point. It'd be great. Nice. Nice. All right, man. Well, hopefully when that part two comes out, it'll be face to face in London. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Definitely, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah. it. Not too late. Have a great day. Absolutely.